Great to meet everybody. Thank you so much for coming and listening to my talk. I know it's a little bit early um, <laughs> in the day, um, but my name is Abby. I'm here to talk about designing for resilience, specifically about decentralized governance and open source ecosystems. I might glance at my notes every once in a while because I just want to sound smart. So um, my name is Abby. I'm the head of community and governance at Radical. Radical is a, a decentralized collaboration ecosystem. We're building open source software that makes it easier for developers to build software together without relying on intermediaries. That's my Twitter if you're interested. Um, so my work at Radical um, has actually been stewarding our transition from a company to a DAO. Um, you're going to see these QR codes throughout my presentation. They link to reference material, um, discourse posts that I've wrote, and that's where the magic happens. So <laughs> if you want to learn more um, about our transition to the DAO, you can actually check out this post right here. Um, and so this work has been to um, decentralize the Radical network. Um, and so. Uh, at my time at Radical, this concept of decentralizing has become quite kind of a contentious topic in that it's, easily to, it's really easy to become disillusioned and slightly bitter about decentralized governance when you're actually doing it because it's really fucking hard. <laughs> um, and so uh, often people now have been asking ourselves, like, why decentralize? Why, why should we when it's so hard to do it? Um, why does everybody have to do it? Decentralization has become more of a cultural principle than the technical principle that it originally was. And so, you know, a lot of people have written about this, including Vitalik, um, QR code there. I'm sure everybody's read his most recent post on um, uh, DAOs are not corporations. Um, and so what Vitalik argues is that, um, you know, in this world, we kind of see that there's like two uh, types of um, uh, organizations, second order and first order organizations, right? So the difference between them are that first order uh, organizations are sovereign. Right? They don't require, they don't have any higher power um, that they rely on. Um, they're able to kind of act autonomously um, and you know, have powers that allow them to defend themselves against other powers from capture. And then the second organization is second order organizations which are contractual. And these rely um, on a sovereign, right? These are corporations, second order uh, organizations. Um, and that these uh, corporations actually act independently like a sovereign, but actually rely on a sovereign's power um, for anything that it wants to do um, that challenges a first order power. Um, and so, you know, the company trusts um, a government or a nation state to enforce its rules. Um, and so it seems that, like in this society, we have really, really good second order organizations and really, really, really bad first order organizations. Um, and so this point that Vitalik argues is that uh, while many people think we should just start designing our first order organizations more like second order organizations, it's actually that we need to design better first order organizations. Um, and that there's actually a lot of uh, use cases in which we need um, sovereignty and non-corporate decentralized forms to keep this whole first order, second organization um, system thriving. And so the reason being is because designing first order sovereign organizations um, allows us to maintain certain qualities that are necessary for long term sustainable um, uh, sovereign um, organizations. The first is censorship resistance. So decentralization allows us to um, function and defend um, despite having external attacks, um, including large corporate or state actors. You know, the argument for censorship resistance has been validated <laughs> before crypto, I think, existed as well. Um, and so censorship resistance is not just like the resistance of permanent censorship, it's actually um, uh, resistance against attempts um, for general instability and disruption. The second is credible neutrality. So um, a system, decentralized system, allows us to um, design mechanisms that do not favor specific people or outcomes. Um, and this concept of credible neutrality um, allows us to truly, truly build uh, systems that are fair and that are equal um, and that can't be corrupted. Um, and so once an infrastructure uh, becomes co-opted um, by extraction, it actually becomes a uh, not credibly neutral in that the users do not the users of that that infrastructure do not have the right 
to, um, to voice, to be free, to innovate, to take risks on that infrastructure itself. And then the last is long-term viability, which is the financial aspect, in that we need to maintain long-term sustainability, reliability, um, and also investment and commitment, because we need to remain competitive against the anti-competitive factors uh, and forces um, that we see um, trying to capture. And so these are all aspects that we think decentralization brings about, and these are all aspects that we believe that first order sovereign organizations need to thrive. And so my ideology that's been developing over the time at Radical is that among the use cases that Vitalik outlines in those posts, uh, such as you know, uh, decentralized courts um, and um, public goods mechanisms, I actually believe that open source technologies that protect civil liberties um, require non-corporate decentralized forms to ensure long-term neutrality, vitality, and capture resistance. So why? Let's look at the internet. The internet is obviously being actively captured. Um, and this is because of, uh, because of like surveillance capitalism <laughs> in that the internet is currently controlled by an economic system that um, benefits on the extraction of data. And this is a spinning cycle that will continue uh, to, to grow as more of the digital world um, eats our physical world, if you will. <laughs> um, and so right now, capture takes many forms. Um, the first of, is obviously extraction. And that personal data, people joke, is going to be more valuable than oil. <laughs> and so extraction takes, um, uh, is captured in the form of extracting rent, extracting information, extracting data, and extracting attention. Um, the second is surveillance, in which um, an organization or uh, um, an, a, a, someone trying to capture a system is able to uh, surveil the behavior, um, surveil the interactions, and surveil the uh, activities of any users on a, a platform. And the final one, which is kind of like a culmination of both, is control, in which when you capture a system, you're able to control the consumption of that system. You're able to control the access, and you're able to control the usage. And so these types of capture lead to information and intermediation capture. Information capture is when um, an organization has so much control over how information is uh, accessed, used, and consumed um, on a, you know, in an open source ecosystem or on a protocol um, that I can actually control and spread its power laterally throughout the markets in which it creates capture network effects, right? Um, which slowly, slowly, slowly grow and um, envelop an ecosystem. And the second is actual intermediation capture in which um, all of these extraction and um, you know, economic systems that profit off of data are actually slowly spinning um, towards anti-competitive forces, monopolization, um, and which lead to more intermediation capture in which more single entities own more and more and more of um, these open networks that build on the internet. And so what I want to point out is that capture is a cumulative process, right? It's not something that just happens. It happens slowly, and it has, happens um, uh, uh, exponentially in that um, you know, organizations can you know, create these capture effects that soon enough lead to centralization. So the accumulation of capture begets uh, centralization. And I know that I don't really have to like review this <laughs> for everybody here, but the risks of centralization are like legit. <laughs> it's actually something that we should be worried about. Centralization limits innovation. It limits users' freedom to take risks and to innovate on a platform. And this is because uh, extraction tends towards anti-competitive forces in which we're uh, siloed into uh, monopolizing and consolidating um, in an effort to keep our extraction flywheel spinning. It also constrains competition for the same reasons that I just said. It reduces availability, it creates a monoculture, and it self-reinforces, meaning it's a, the more and more it centralizes, the harder and harder it is to decentralize. And so being vulnerable to capture and censorship challenges the credible neutrality of open source infrastructure um, and thus compromises its long-term viability. And so this is something that Right now, in our age of surveillance capitalism, there's a high probability that we will literally soon face this dystopia we all envision that's outlined by Westworld and, um, you know, um, like, I, Mr. My, what is it, Mr. Robot? Yes, that's what it is. Um, and so we'll soon face this dystopia where all of our transactions and interactions in the digital world will be brokered by a few or even a single company. Um, and that's kind of what we all joke about as Fang being, but it's a very harsh reality and very real. And 
if we consider ourselves part of the digital world, the, the pioneers, the fighters, the freedom fighters for financial privacy, this, is, this future looks dismal. <laughs> if, our, um, if, our, if our internet has already been actively captured by these external forces, think about when we start challenging the principles of financial privacy and um, uh, preservation um, in which all of our decentralized technologies are built off of right now. And we've already seen this happen in practice with companies like and projects like open source projects like Tornado Cash. So how do we design for resilience? I'm going to check on time here. Cool. I'm almost like 10, I'm only 10 minutes in. This is great. <laughs> so how do we design for resilience? And this is kind of like the biggest question. It's obvious that we need to build resilient open source infrastructure um, to better uh, support a future of not only technical privacy, um, but uh, financial privacy, which we agree is the online civil liberties and freedom that we um, would like to see in this world. Um, and so the first point that I want to make that I've been learning as I research more and more about like open source ecosystems and governance in open source ecos ecosystems is that a decentralized system is, does not always re resist centralization. Um, and that a decentralized system in the sense of having not a topological uh, central point of control is neither necessary or sufficient to actually eliminate the excess of power in a system. This is taken from um, a really great um, writer on this topic, Robin Berjan. I have some of his links in the reference that I can share. Um, but the point is that just being centralized, technically decentralized, architecturally decentralized, is actually not enough to resist um, some of these um, centralization capture methods that we're seeing um, currently capturing the internet. Um, and the, what, how I want to back this is that you can also see three examples um, of different open source ecosystems that technically um, are not entirely decentralized yet have um, different means of intentional centralization with intentional decentralization um, that allow them to maintain critical open source infrastructure. Obviously, the first one is Tor. So Tor started as open source university research. And actually, the first funders of Tor were the EFF, the Electronic Frontier um, Foundation, which allowed Tor to establish itself um, as the Tor Project, which is like a nonprofit um, um, project that funds its maintainers and contributors um, and a volunteer-based open source community. For those who don't know Tor, it's one of the most um, important privacy-preserving uh, technologies that allows people to access the internet no matter where they are, and it is actually a technology that is constantly fighting against um, uh, malicious sovereign states such as uh, you know, such as every state now. I can't even compare one to the other. <laughs> um, and so the maintainers are actually funded by the EFF in early years and slowly transitioned to funding from DARPA, Georgetown University, and the Ford Foundation. Um, and now exists as like, a very critical piece of open source infrastructure that's pretty well maintained um, and has established a legal standing um, in which it can exist um, in our free world. The second is the W3C, which is the Worldwide Web Consortium, um, which is a member-funded standards organization that's admi uh, administered by a couple host organizations. So this is started by like the founder of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, um, in an effort to create more of a decentralized organization for managing like the standards of our internet. Um, if and nobody's read about and learned about W3 governance, I would definitely learn about it. But it's a great experiment in multi-stakeholder governance in which the governance is actually backed on the members um, and the partners of the consortium itself. But there's a clear hierarchy in that there are clear powers. It's not just complete decentralization, direct democracy. There's actually clear expres uh, expressions of power and consolidations of power. But the governance system is built on that and works within it. And then finally, there's Rust. Rust started as a Mozilla research project, um, and which was originally funded by Google. Um, and Rust, in, throughout its uh, lifetime, has decentralized and become autonomous with governance that's maintained by a core team of individuals. Oh no, my slides are done. But so Rust is very interesting because it also has um, you know, this Rust Foundation, which was started as a central entity. However, this foundation is actually funded by Amazon, Google, <laughs> and other um, massive tech corporations. And so those are three examples of open source ecosystems that, again, are building decentralized, open source, critical infrastructure that a lot, everything that we build is built on top of, right? Um, however, you start to see that there's still different means of capture and different, um, uh, um, I guess, like consequences of how these uh, systems are built. For example, with Tor, the reason that Tor has the legal standing that can defend against sovereign attacks is because of the early legal institutional work that the EFF put in to make sure that it can exist as this open source software. 
the W3C is a member-based uh, organization, but actually has no checks and balances, meaning like the director is completely untouchable by, by membership. There's a really good post on this in my um, uh, resources that you can, I mean references that you can read about this more. Um, and this member-based organization model has diluted over time and increases the organization's uh, re like dependence on other um, organizations. And then finally, there's Rust. <laughs> Rust governance has succeeded because Mozilla has hand-funded full-time contributors to making it work, right? It's not completely decentralized. It has huge dependencies on Mozilla, and it has started decentralizing away from it, and I'm not saying that they haven't made amazing progress, um, but the Mozilla layoffs actually forced Rust to form the foundation and to decentralize its funding source um, because of how intermediated the relationship between Mozilla um, and the Rust ecosystem is. And now this foundation, as I said, is run by um, massive tech corporations and is reliant on um, those uh, corporations' funding as well. And so basically, what I'm trying to present or pitch to you all is that I think that decentralized governance mechanisms enable an alternative, alternative endgame for open source infrastructure, and that we can actually continue decentralizing, and we can do it in a way that supports the long-term resilience, vitality, um, and um, capture resistance of these open source, critical open source infrastructure that's preserving technical and financial privacy. And so uh, this end game is where critical open source projects evolve to operate as community owned and operated, governed, self-sustaining online organizations that are resistant to capture and intermediation. So I kind of call them dev DAOs. It's like my working title, I'm not sure about it yet, but it's a class of DAOs, if you will, um, whose goal and prerogative and mandate is to maintain, develop, and grow critical open source infrastructure. And I actually think that, um, I don't know who else is a Star Wars fan here, um, but I think that dev DAOs are kind of like the new hope for, her, um, for the web and the internet in general, not just crypto, because I think that this is how we can build open source infrastructure that can resist the external factors that are currently capturing um, our internet and our digital world. And so there's a couple of things that we need <laughs> to make that happen and to do it well. Because right now, I think a lot of people would look at that slide and be like, wow, uh, you know, dev DAOs can never be <laughs> Anakin Skywalker. <laughs> um, and so there's a couple qualities that um, these decentralized governance mechanisms need to actually fulfill this vision of um, maintaining uh, capture resistant open source software. The first is exit. So it must be easy and practical for the participants of a system uh, to leave one infrastructure provider for another. And this is technical, so this is a concept of modularity, of interoperability, but it's also financial, in which there must be a way for participants to exit a system to ensure that the power is aligned with the people who are, have power within that system. The second is voice. So stakeholders must have like a genuine influence in a highly decentralized and diverse governance system. Um, you can tell that right now in token voting systems, they're extremely plutocratic. They're decentralized when you look at them, but they're actually centralized when you um, examine you know, the way that these power works within these systems. Stakeholders must have an actual genuine way to vote, and that governance system must be diverse enough to include the um, more voices from uh, the stakeholders in a system. It can't just, power cannot just remain in the hands of a few. And then finally is loyalty, and this is kind of like an interesting one. Ownership distributions must attract, incentivize, and retain contributors um, in the long term while establishing dynamic, uh, while remaining dynamic enough to adapt to the growth of an ecosystem. And so this speaks to like the long term um, vitality and viability of these open source ecosystems in which we actually must remain competitive against anti-competitive forces, right? Um, if we don't have these forces within us that are attracting, that are incentivizing, um, that are growing, um, that we won't be able to remain competitive as we start to see um, the forces of capture um, come and uh, rear their head. And this is actually where I think that crypto and decentralized technologies offer a new lens, a new design space in which we're able to redesign our incentives. And so right now, how do we build? Um, I wanted to talk practically with the time that I had left, about how we can start doing this now. How can we start designing resilience in open source ecosystems and present a little approach, maybe a step-by-step -step process, if you will, of how what questions you can start answering yourselves as the stewards of this new future. Um, and so the first is to scope your decentralized de sorry, <laughs> scope your decentralization needs based on your organizational needs and your technological needs um, and evolutionary purpose. So 
not everybody has the same um, resilience score that's required to maintain the growth of an ecosystem or an infrastructure in the long term. And everybody should start asking themselves about what are the needs of their stakeholders, what are their motivations, and what outcomes do they require. Then you can design sovereign governance mechanisms and contractual checks and balances. And this is where the decentralized and centralized come and start playing together, is that it doesn't, it's not a binary, it's a spectrum. And we need to start figuring out where on the spectrum we exist. We need to start designing sovereign mechanisms that support this resilience score, the resilience that we need to maintain a technology uh, in the long term. And we need to encode checks and balances with a set of rules, right? And these can be on-chain or they can be off-chain. With these rules, then we can localize decision making and resource allocation to autonomous polycentric suborgs, right? And this is a concept of delegating trust and delegating autonomy to ensure that people um, within an organization can actually act as second order organizations, relying on the sovereign first order organization, the parent DAO, if you will, um, and enable this autonomous network of sub DAOs that are all interacting with each other. This reduces org-wide governance surface area by distributing um, contractual decision-making processes and also allows us to stand up succession practices that allow us to transfer power um, throughout the organization. So instead of just seeing an organization that goes from startup to IPO and then like slowly dies, we're now starting to see a growing dynamic ecosystem of um, participants who are growing and contributing, which is ultimately contributing to the longer-term resilience of the technology itself. Then finally, there's three more, which is disintermediating funding sources, um, which is establishing independent ecosystem sources of funds um, that allow to, you to reduce the dependence on your own core team or um, you know, uh, leaders of the project. You can also embrace optimistic funding methods for actually embedding res uh, autonomy and trusting suborgs in that they can operate on their own with their own funding, um, yet again are kind of maintained by these set of rules that are set at the org-wide level. And you can also stand up long-term funding sources for maintainers, which is critical. You need to have long-term people stewarding this decentralization or else it won't work. And then finally, there's distribu uh, distribute ownership um, and distribute influence. And I can talk through why those two are different in my last slide. I'm just a little bit over, but I promise I'm going to be done soon. So this is what we're actively doing in the Radical Project. We're currently transitioning from a company to a DAO, but not just any DAO. We're transitioning to more of a member-based organization in which the contributors and the participants and the maintainers of the Radical Project are the ones guiding the governance forth um, to better support uh, the creation of like censorship-resistant, capture-resistant, open-source infrastructure that can be used for developers to build capture-resistant, censorship-resistant infrastructure. And right now, we have three ways that we're doing that. First is distributing ownership. So we're devising and implementing an active st uh, strategy for distributing token rewards among network stakeholders to ensure loyalty, long-term royalty, and long-term um, uh, commitment. And so this it means transitioning from a plutocratic ownership model, which we have now in our token va uh, voting governance system, to a more member-based one. The second is uh, distributing influence. So we're designing and implementing a strategy for distributing non-financialized governance influence because we think that's a critical aspect of actually distributing influence and embedding voice in an open source uh, decentralized governance organization. Um, we're doing this using tools like Otter Space who are building like NFT membership standards that allow you to understand who is in your organization, how you can, uh, and then how you can distribute influence to them. And then finally is the decentralized org design, which is actually restructuring the Radical DAO ecosystem to support nested autonomous polycentric organizations that exhibit their own governance processes, uh, manage their own pools of capital, um, and their own organizational structure. Um, we're starting with the core development org, which you can kind of read about more here in this QR code, which is how we transition all of our current Radical Foundation funded projects to be funded by the DAO and organize around themselves. So decentralizing ourselves throughout this process. So yeah, I'm a little bit over. Thank you so much for <laughs> listening to me talk. Um, I would love to talk about this more online. So this is a type form. If you scan the QR code, you can, um, it's just like a little type form. You can ask me a question, share your comments, um, share your thoughts. If you hated it, tell me, I would love to know. Um, and I'm actually gonna be answering questions on Twitter throughout the week. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts and engage more about this discussion in public. Um, and you can follow me at Abby Tipcomb, Abby underscore Tipcomb on Twitter. I talk about this stuff maybe too much. Thank you guys so much for listening.